There were times when they would see a dark figure going past their dining room window and their cat would scream at it and would go Definitely, as I as I got deeper and deeper into a number of different things in the occult, uh, I was I was becoming just aware that these things were around me. While I was talking with him, uh, his natural face disappeared, and instead I saw a huge red, frightening face, uh, kind of scaly skin. And so if a person, say they saw a spirit or something in the room, if I was in the room, would I have seen it? And the answer is probably not, because there was nothing material there. It was spiritual. Well, then it's not real. Oh, yes, it is. And then he turned to me. I was standing at the end of the counter, and he said, looked me straight in the eye, and he said, but you, you know who I am. working under a cloak of darkness, prowling to and fro, searching for their next victim, hidden and yet seen, evil yet masquerading as angels of light. For centuries, man has battled, even been fascinated with demons those creatures of the spiritual realm on the loose from the very depths of hell. Their commander, Satan, or the devil himself. Is it true? Do demons actually exist? And are they a threat to you and to me? Within the next few moments, we will answer these and other questions. We'll talk to experts, some of the church, some not of the church, who will clearly explain demons and their belief or disbelief in what demons can and cannot do. We'll talk to everyday men and women, some young, some old, who believe they have come in contact with demons. We'll even meet a former chief investigator of the FBI who has investigated satanic worship and the people who have pledged their lives to these very real forces of evil. Centuries ago, talk of demons and demonic encounters were commonplace, but in the 18th century, the rise of rationalism, known as the Enlightenment, became the new way of seeing the world. The Western world dismissed all aspects of the evil spiritual realm, while the rest of the world continued to acknowledge very real encounters with the powers of darkness. Today, evil is clearly on the rise everywhere. Experts and theologians agree we now have no choice but to acknowledge the powers that are bringing our world to its demise. Alan and his entire family have always been aware of the spiritual realm. By his early teenage years, Alan set off on a journey for spiritual truth. My family always had a history of having premonitions and different things on my mother's side. And when my mother married my dad, my mom would have these little premonitions. And she'd tell them to my dad, and my dad's a big, burly, Polish guy, and he says, you know, ah, oh, you're making up things, and, or you're just, you're just thinking that, or you're, and don't put any stock in it. And she would be right. And so I always grew up with stories like that about ants who would ask if the crops were going to be good, and the, they'd get wrappings on the wall. Um, knocks on the wall. So I thought that, that that therefore because it was in my family after watching movies and stuff, ah, now I can be have the same things happen to me. And when I was a little kid, I, uh, uh, I think I was in about, I was, must have been in seventh grade, 
uh, we were in rural North Dakota. My dad was in the military, and we were way out in the middle of nowhere, and my room was facing a big blank field with no lights outside, and I would have a light that would appear on my wall and move from my wall over to basically my, uh, my lamp that was by my bedstand. It would go across one wall and go on another. My junior year in high school was their senior year, and uh, a bunch of us were close friends, and therefore we were staring after the party and just kind of hanging out and talking. And there were basically three girls that I was very good friends with. And um, I had been gone for a year. I had moved away and had just come back. So they were asking me about what I was doing in my life. And I began to tell them that I had given up on God and on church and different things. And I was starting to look um, into philosophy and into the occult. And I was going to try and find out the truth and the meaning of life. I had some tarot cards in my pocket and, and showed them to them and they got excited and explained uh, basically what they could do and uh, that we could uh, basically ask the cards some questions and I could read them and tell them, uh, predict their future or tell them what was going on in the situation behind the scenes and things they might not know. Definitely as I, as I got deeper and deeper into a number of different things in the occult, uh, I, was, I was becoming just aware that these things were around me and that they, they were interested in my life, you know, and what I was doing and where I was going and different things like that. Even though Alan's family had a history of toying with the unknown, they knew he had come in contact with dangerous and destructive forces. So they took him to CRI, the Christian Research Institute. There he met several experts including the author of Cult of a Virgin, Crash Course on the New Age Movement, and the editor of the Christian Research Journal. His name is Elliot Miller. Well, it is a documentable fact that when people participate in occult practices, whether it's tarot cards, Ouija board, magic, uh, astrology, any practice that is intended to give people power and to give people for hidden knowledge, they are entering into the forbidden zone. Uh, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, uh, Moses lays out a whole list of occult practices, pretty much runs the gamut. Uh, he doesn't name everything you can think of, but he lays out the basic categories that would encompass the whole world of occult phenomena. Mm -hmm. And he says, you shall not have anything to do with this. And so we're talking about something that is forbidden. He says it's an abomination to God because people are basically turning, uh, uh, looking for spiritual power in sources other than God himself, you see. And the idea behind that is really to exalt me, to, to allow me to manipulate others in reality to further my own desires. You see, and that is intrinsically evil. That's why it's an abomination to God. When you enter into that realm, there is a certain amount of power that you can uh, make contact with. The power really comes from demons themselves. They will always lead you into a false philosophy. Furthermore, practicing these things opens you up to their influence. When people just, for example, dabble in something like the Ouija board, what they're doing is opening up a forbidden doorway, and that door remains open. From that point on, someone can expect strange things to begin to develop in their lives. A deception begins to develop. Augustine said, quote, Pagan magic, religion, and sorcery were all invented by the devil for the purpose of luring humanity away from Christian truth. Some of the effects of sorcery are real, others are imagined. Whether reality or imagined, all are works of the devil." End quote. Why would Satan and his demons crusade against Christian truth? For the answer, we look to the number one best-selling book of all time, the Bible. There we learn the history of Satan and his demons. God alone existed in the beginning. Then he created the heavens. 
and with the heavens innumerable angels. The angels were ranked in authority, with perhaps the most powerful angel, the one called Lucifer. He was beautiful and strong, superior even to the archangel Michael. But then, in his evil hour, his eye was turned from his creator and onto himself. He saw himself as the highest, the most gifted, and the most influential of all of God's creatures. Lucifer's heart welled with pride and ambition, and rebellion took possession of his soul. Lucifer desired to be God. A war broke out in heaven. The angels were divided and took sides. Lucifer tricked and deceived one-third of all of the angels into enlisting into his army. The remaining two-thirds of the angels stayed with God, and God appointed the archangel Michael head over his holy army. The holy God watched the battle and said of Lucifer, You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created, till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence, and you sinned. The war raged on, until the army of Michael the Archangel defeated Lucifer and his emissaries. Michael and the faithful angels prevailed. Lucifer lost, and God drove him from the Mount of God in disgrace. Before all in heaven who watched, God made fire come out of Lucifer, and made fire consume him. All watched the once most beautiful of angels fall from heaven like lightning. With Lucifer, his rebellious army was also outcast. Lucifer became known as Satan, and the angels known as demons. All were hurled into what is called the bottomless pit, or hell. From there, since then, the devil, or Satan, has not let up. Some of Satan's demons are bound in hell forever, while others are loose to do their master's work. Satan, with those demons, roam the earth, seeking who they might devour. The uh, angels that did not keep their first estate God has imprisoned in chains of darkness. However, most demons seem to be free to move about. And uh, so they are in the spiritual realm, but they are capable of interacting with the earth. Roaming the earth, seeking who they might devour. Can a demon actually inhabit the body of another human being? Carol would say yes, after an experience she had in a beauty supply store. shopping at a little beauty supply store in a mall and the, the, the store was run by two um, very dear women and I was poking around looking in the store and while I was there I noticed that they seemed very alarmed and kind of huddled together in one corner of the store and I was looking, looking trying to see what was the object of their discomfort and I saw a very tall man with dyed hair and kind of outrageously dressed roaming around the store and causing all kinds of disruption with his voice and poking at things and talking to himself and um, they were very nervous they were very undone and frankly it was was a strange event it was unnerving to have this guy mumbling to himself and uh, we all kind of felt vulnerable yeah. frankly in the store So um, he kept making a huge uh, to-do about things, and at, my, at the time, through my mind, I thought, I wonder if he was on drugs or, or what his purpose there was, actually. And um, he, he turns to the women at the counter, and he said, well, don't worry, I'm leaving now. You don't have to worry about me anymore. In fact, and he sort of laughed maniacally, he said, you don't even really know who I am. And then he turned to me, I was standing at the end of the counter, and he said, looked at me straight in the eye, and he said, but you 
you know who I am. And I knew who he was. In my heart registered, this was pure evil I was looking at. And not only that, but the irises of his eyes were almost translucent white. They were like an albino white. And I hadn't seen his eyes up to this time, but he looked, looked at me with these white eyes and laughed. And when he said, boom, within me, I knew I was really confronting evil. And I was, in my thought, in my mind, I was thinking, yes, I know who I, you, you are. So he left, and the women just stared at each other, embracing each other, and stared at me, and we all just kind of were very, very nervous about the whole thing. And, and then I said, you know, um, that, that was really, that was really a demon. That was somebody from, straight from the pit of hell who was here. And they all acknowledged that. And I said, you know, um, we have an opportunity, even though that was really disruptive, I said, we, we have a chance to have peace and have a greater peace because even somebody like that who would want to disrupt cannot stand up to the name of Jesus. And so at that point, um, I, I asked the women if they would like to all pray together and just pray for peace in the store and protection. And um, they were quite open to that. They wanted to do that. And I wanted to do that too because it was real nerve-wracking. So we all prayed together and um, then I left. Dr. Neil Anderson has devoted his life to studying and teaching about the evil spiritual realm. He travels the world teaching his seminar, resolving personal and spiritual conflicts, and has authored two books, Victory Over Darkness and The Bondage Breaker. When people see an object move, it may or may not have moved, but let me illustrate something here. We're, we're in a spiritual battle. And when somebody says that they hear voices, and the person, let's say the counselor who's trying to deal with them says, I don't hear those voices. Well, they must be out of touch with reality, so they're mentally ill. I'm here to tell you from a biblical perspective, the one that's out of touch with, you, with, with reality may not necessarily be the, the client. It may be the counselor. What they're hearing is real, but the problem is it's not out there. It's the same problem when people say they see something, something entered the room. Now think about this for a moment. You don't see with your physical eyes anything without having a light source reflecting off of a material object back to your eyes. And so if a person, say they saw a spirit or something in their room, if I was in the room, would I have seen it? And the answer is probably not, because there was nothing material there. It was spiritual. Well, then it's not real. Oh, yes, it is. It is. The problem is it's not out there. It's right here between the ears. That's the nature of the spiritual battle that is going on, whether people hear things or see things. Loopy had an experience similar to Carol's. She met a woman who seemed average and normal enough, until one day she saw something she had never seen before. Well, I was involved with uh, teaching, or coaching rather, a uh, basketball team, girls basketball team. And the woman that we're talking about, Carmen, was introduced to me by a mutual friend who sort of felt bad for this woman who seemed to be lonely and not have any friends and thought maybe a rec center and a group kind of situation would help her life a bit and asked if I didn't want to become involved in that, being that it was a lot of us moms that were raising our kids mm -hmm. and being involved uh, with this basketball team, and right. she happened to be there. She was introduced to me, and I chatted with her for a little while, and asked her if she wanted to come over and have coffee some evening, and visit, or, you know, asked her about her kids, and just struck up a real normal conversation with her, as two moms would do. She had children, so did I. And so she did come over one evening. She came over, and I think I even made her dinner, and. Her kids came up, and we were sitting around the living room after dinner and just chatting, but I started to notice that she was a little strange as we sat there. And um, I began to ask her more about herself because I was just curious, it, a little strangeness to this woman, a little darkness, or I can't think of another way because it wasn't an insanity 
kind of strange. It was just real, felt really different. I noticed that she had lit a cigarette and just began to slowly make burns on her arms. You know, and when you first see that, you're just sort of like frozen. You don't believe that you're actually seeing someone burning themselves. And she was not wincing. She was not having any physical reaction. It's almost as if she was doing that while she thought about her answer mm -hmm. and watching herself burn her arm. And she looked up at me. And when she looked up at me, her eyes became covered with a, a slimy cloudiness. I won't even say cloudiness, but her eyes were not there. There was like a cloudiness there, but it was slimy looking. It was really bizarre. Her face had changed. And she looked at me and said, um, don't talk to us that way. Don't, don't talk to us like that. We don't like to be spoken to that way. And it was a different voice. It was not her voice at all. And it had uh, a depth, almost as if it was coming from far away. Not like it was actually right there in front of me. And so it was a very confusing few moments because she would like slip back and forth and there were apparently like different entities there, but they were all bent on destruction and she was going to take her small children and drive off of the cliff and started burning the other arm and wouldn't stop. And I wasn't sure whether to reach out and knock the cigarette. It was, it all happened so fast, but it wasn't the only time it happened before she finally sort of slipped out of our lives. She would do things like this all the time to a point to where a voice would come up and say, hi, remember me? And it would be one of the other voices that had been. Definitely demonic uh, manifestations. You know, there's so many things out that are beyond our physical world. You know, how could we think that all we have is this physical world? You know, I really believe that there are many different things out there, a host of, of a creation, you know, demonic and, and good and of all kinds that we don't even know. But I really believe this was a de demonic influence that she probably somewhat brought on herself by lifestyle or decisions and, and things that she may have been dabbling in, or generational even, who knows, things that her, because she did mentioned that her family, she was Puerto Rican, had been involved in many different forms of witchcraft when she was a child. I don't personally believe that Satan is omniscient or omnipresent. And frankly, never ascribe the divine attributes of God onto Satan. And so if he's not omnipresent, how does he carry on a worldwide work? The answer is through principalities, powers, dominions, and rulers. In the Gospels, there are numerous accounts of people who are demonized or possessed by the devil who confront Jesus, and where he is, uh, he sort of brought them out. They, they uh, were intimidated by him, they were threatened by him, and they pled with him not to cast them into the abyss. Uh, and in fact, he would uh, cast them out of the people that they possess. So we know possession is a real thing. Jesus believed in it. Jesus dealt with it. Uh, and that was not just for the time of Jesus, because in the book of Acts, Jesus' followers, his disciples, his appointed representatives also had confrontations with demons. Does it take a demonic oppression or possession to convince people that Satan and his demons are real? Ask any police agency in the world and they would say no. Satanic cults are on the rise. Or simply put, churches or groups of people gather to worship their god, Satan. Much of their activity is absolutely unmentionable. But we must warn you, even as we just scratch the surface, the information is shocking. Ted Gunderson is retired from the FBI. His 28-year career included being senior special agent in charge, directing 700 employees at an annual budget of $22.5 million. He has authored a book entitled How to Locate Anyone Anywhere Without Leaving Home, and has authored this two-volume set entitled Corruption, The Satanic Cult Drug Network and Missing Children. I've been involved in investigating these, this element in our society for some 15 years, since 1980 as a matter of fact. And I have had hundreds of people come forward across the country with the same basic story without even knowing each other. And these people are reputable, they're credible, 
I've also discussed this with police officers who've been to the scene of the crime. Uh, I've talked to journalists who are investigating these matters. Uh, I've talked to uh, uh, other individuals who are uh, highly respectable who agree with me. And uh, the documentation is out there, there's no question about it. They would say that there is, yes, they believe that there is a Satan, of course. Lucifer, they talk about Lucifer on a regular basis, absolutely. I'm documenting uh, the individual activities of this element in our society, of the Satanists. For example, I have a number of uh, people who uh, are uh, adult survivors, and adult survivors, somebody who was born into the Satanic movement, their grandfathers, grandmothers, and so forth, were active in it and they decided they wanted to get out. They don't like it, for some reason or other. One little girl told me that uh, her mother forced her to go to Sunday school when she was a little girl. Her mother was a Satanist, and uh, the only peace that she had and through her childhood, because of all the nefarious activity that she was exposed to, was when what the Sunday school teacher talked to her about Jesus, and she saw a picture of Jesus on the wall, and she decided that Jesus was her friend. This girl today is on the run. I've got her in hiding here in Southern California. And uh, her father, uh, according to her, her father's involved, her mother's involved in satanic activity. She came to me about three years ago and said, what do I do? I want to get out. They're going to kill me. I'm afraid they're going to kill me. I said, go underground. She's underground right today. So far, everyone we've talked to has seen demons through other human lives. But what about the stories where people see demons in their true original form? Liz manages an apartment building. A demon presence there affected not only one of her tenants, but her three-year-old son. Well, first of all, I am an apartment manager. And so a couple who lived next door to my apartment wanted to move into a two-bedroom, and I had to do a walkthrough with them to just check the apartment out mm -hmm. while they were moving out. When we were in the hallway, I noticed there was a piece of paper taped to the wall with a cross on it. And I asked her, what is this paper doing on the wall? She said, well, you're the first one that's asked me that question. And I don't know if I should really tell you, because you might think I'm strange, but it's a, it was a metaphysical window. I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so I took the piece of paper down and I noticed that in that one spot in the whole hallway, in the whole apartment, the paint had peeled off. There was an actual hole within the paint. Um, there were no paint chips. Nobody ever found any paint chips on anything. It's just this circle that was impressed into the paint. And it was obvious. I said, why don't you tell me, Patty, what happened? She said that when she first moved in there, she would hear uh, strange things and see, um, see uh, dark figures moving around. When she married this, her husband, he, his background is a Buddhist and um, into the New Age religion. I really don't know what that all means. He went around the apartment trying to um, deliver the apartment from the spirit and he would burn tarragon. I'm not understanding the significance of that, but it didn't work. There were times when they would see a dark figure going past their dining room window and their cat would scream at it and would go and would just cling right onto the window, the cat did. Um, they saw a dark figure several times in their bedroom. And the husband kept trying to do everything he could in his power to get rid of it. This one particular night, they were in bed and this uh, dark figure, they described it as having a hood, but it, it appeared to be a man, but in um, black clothing.
Okay, honey, we'll lay back down. It's the middle of the night. Nothing's wrong. There's nothing in the room. Just try to go back to sleep, okay? Okay. Good night. Okay. Shh, it's okay. It's okay. It's not okay. You saw that thing. You burnt the paint right off the wall. Are you guy this does something? As she was describing the story to me, I remember that night because uh, I've never heard him scream so loudly and I got up, I went in to check on him and he was just kind of at that point just moaning and tossing and turning and um, I just pulled the covers back up and he rolled back over and went to sleep. But I do remember that night very clearly. They heard him scream and uh, they realized that something was coming out of that hole. I believe that Steve had had dreams about seeing this man inside this hole. So they got up in the middle of the night, took a piece of paper, crayoned a cross on this paper and taped it so that uh, the face side of the cross faced into the hole into this portion where the paint had chipped off. When that happened, they never saw it again. And they explained to me that my children also started sleeping much calmer every night. There was no more... They sometimes would have hard times going to sleep in that room, and they would wake up sometimes, um, and they could hear it. And they said after that point, there was much peace. Uh, unfortunately, what's happening is, in, in the rise and the curiosity of, and the leer of knowledge and power, people are just scrambling uh, to, to fill the void of, of a spiritual vacuum that really doesn't exist. And so, consequently, looking for some spiritual reality, the New Age is offering a tremendous, um, seemingly, uh, banquet here for people. Boy, you can have spiritual reality and you can also have materialism. All you got to do is realize that you're God, and what you really need is a spirit guide. And what a gullible public that we have today. Just change the name and suddenly it's palatable. Nobody particularly wants to have a demon, uh, and nobody is, would probably normally go out and seek a channeler. All of, or I mean, a, a, seek a, a medium or a spiritist, uh, all of which uh, in the Old Testament were to be stoned to death. So let's just change their name. Let's not call them... Um, let's not call him a medium, let's not call him a, uh, a spiritist or something, let's just call them a channeler. Uh, let's not call that demon a demon, let's call it a spirit guide. And suddenly, a gullible public says, I, I want that. I said, it's the same thing, changing the name did not change the function. There have been visual manifestations of demons recorded uh, on a few occasions. But uh, normally this would be, uh, I believe, in the case of deception. Not so much to scare you, but to mislead you. In fact, we're told in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, that one of Satan's tactics is to assume the form of an angel of light. 
And so people will have uh, manifestations, for example, of spirit guides mm -hmm. or ascended masters or angels or even Jesus or Buddha or, or other entities that are supposedly benevolent. And these are for the purposes of deception. The Bible refers to Satan as a lion roaming the earth seeking who he might devour. But Satan is not omnipresent, meaning he can't be in more than one place at one time. So he sends his demons, as is the case of our next story. Well, it was it was a number of years ago, and I had been going up to a center to learn some holistic health practices. And my teacher, um, I, I thought he was great, but I had some misgivings about him. I wasn't feeling completely comfortable with everything that he was teaching us. And so I made a decision that I was going to leave the class. And I went to him and I told him that I wasn't going to continue. And while I was talking with him, uh, his natural face disappeared and instead I saw a huge red frightening face uh, kind of scaly skin a large nose and bulging eyes and it was terrifying looking I think it was a demon I did not know at the time I was just so incredulous that what I was seeing it was just as real as flesh and blood and I was fearful and just shocked in about 10, 10 seconds or so, uh, his natural face appeared. The face continued to speak to me, and uh, I just ended the conversation quickly. I later found out from three separate people that knew him well, much better than I, that he, in fact, was heavily involved with uh, sorcery, witchcraft, some kind of satanic occult practices. So I had it confirmed from three separate sources who were very involved with uh, what I now know to be demonic. In 1983, I believe it was, uh, information was furnished by a child to uh, that child's mother that uh, she had witnessed human sacrifices at the McMartin Preschool in Manhattan Beach, California, and other type of activity. And uh, the investigation began at that point. The McMartins were the pillars of the community. That was the most uh, highly respected uh, preschool, probably in the, one of the most in the United States. And uh, so the, an investigation began, and uh, there were uh, n uh, numerous children were interviewed, and they identified uh, actors, professional football players, professional baseball players, as perpetrators. And the children claimed that they were that there were tunnels under the school. They claimed that they were taken through the tunnels and into the tunnels and molested. By the way, they claimed that they were taken out of the tunnels into the triplex next door, up into the bathroom where the bathtub moved and taken out into automobiles and prostituted in the community to the businessman, some of the businessmen. There's just so many highly placed government officials who are actively involved in this. This overlaps into pedophilia. I'm working on a case right now and have been for about the last four years out of Lincoln and Omaha, Nebraska, where children uh, uh, were taken out of Boys Town and out of a private girls' school by limousine to Sioux City, Iowa. They were placed on private jets, flown to Washington, D.C., where they were involved in sex orgy parties with politicians and other prominent individuals. So when you have uh, congressmen and senators involved, and they've identified these congressmen and senators, uh, and governors, uh, you have a problem uh, with credibility. You can't go around saying congressman so-and-so or senator so-and-so was at a party in such and such a location in Washington, D.C., and I saw him engaged in a sex act with a 10-year-old boy, people think you're crazy. Demon sightings are clearly more prevalent in certain parts of the world. Africans, Asians, Latin Americans, and inhabitants of the Oceania intuitively know the reality of the spiritual world. James was born in Kenya. He remembers the presence of demons in every aspect of his family's and his tribe's lives. He writes about his experiences in his thesis entitled, Witchcraft Among the Akumba and the African Inland Church. My parents practiced every traditional 
uh, religious practice, um, including witchcraft. They knew about uh, uh, what is involved in, uh, in witchcraft. For example, they knew the people that can, can practice witchcraft. And my grandmother, my mother trained me on identifying these people. And they also took us uh, to witch doctors so that we may be fortified. Fortified is so that you may be protected. It's like uh, surrounding you with, uh, with treatment that no witch can penetrate with his witchery um, art or things like that. They, they prepared us against it because it is practiced. It's a real thing, it is practiced. In, in, in families and uh, those that uh, in the village do not uh, uh, want your progress or do not want existence of any child of yourself, they can uh, work out that your child dies. Yes, they know their master. They know their master and they have conduct. They have the supernatural visiting from the devil or from the demons, any messenger he, he, he may want to, to utilize in this case. Okay. Um, the demons. Uh, the, uh, the witch may be sleeping and may be given whom to destroy or whom to begin to prepare to destroy or to harm. May be uh, told that there is a child being born in, certain, uh, in a certain village and therefore would be uh, uh, prompted to, to go there and get involved with, uh, with the whole uh, uh, process of uh, uh, midwifery, uh, bring that child out. And when the child is coming out and has this drug put in the mouth and the child doesn't uh, live. Demons like any angelic beings come in forms of men or of women. And I may want to indicate that. Uh, my mother was demon possessed many, many times. One time she was sleeping and the demons visited her and she was carried away to a, a place where they had uh, uh, um, Satan worship or some, some sacrifices of some kind. Chances are they will dope up the victim. In fact, they will. They'll dope up the victim. They'll bring him in. They'll put him on the altar. They call it the altar. Uh, they will um, have, uh, they will do some chanting. And they will, the, the adults will be dressed in robes and the children too. Uh, black, red robes, depending on the, the ceremony itself. And uh, he, at, a, at a certain time, prescribed time during the ceremony, uh, if they are uh, indoctrinating a child into this, they will have the, and this is a true story that was passed on to me, the child's hand was placed on a knife and the father of the child, who was a practicing Satanist, put his hand over top the child's hand and thrust the knife into the, uh, the body of the infant that was being sacrificed. Oftentimes, uh, there's a certain way that they cut the body, like the cross, the, the face like this, and so forth. They cut it down, they peel the body back, they will uh, take the heart while it's still pumping, and, uh, and eat part of it, and cannibalize it. Is there a difference in the demonic activity in America? Perhaps the most knowledgeable person to answer that question today is Tim Werner. He literally travels the globe, educating people on the powers of evil. He is author of this book, Spiritual Warfare. In my judgment, there's really no question whether demons are real. I've dealt with too many of them in too many different places. It's also an almost universal belief system by, of people around the world. I've traveled in many, many countries around the world, and there's almost no place where this isn't a a really critical element of their whole belief system. So much so that even uh, university professors in places like Thailand almost in, are entirely animistic in their belief system in relation to this. That is to say, 
they just believe they're real. The president of the university in Bangkok, Thailand, regularly consults the spirits before making major academic decisions. And while they appear on the surface as intellectuals operating in the Western educational environment, at their basic belief system, they believe in spirits. Satan is an opportunist, and he takes existing situations and capitalizes on them. So out there, the people have a very strong power orientation to life. So he operates more in the power areas, and you see more of the overt kinds of, of demonic demonstrations. In the United States, we have more of a, a mental orientation to life, so he specializes more in deception, causing us to believe doctrines of demons and uh, uh, coming from deceptive spirits. Uh, though we are beginning to see more of the power demonstrations even here in the United States, uh, altered states of consciousness, uh, out-of-the-body experiences, uh, that sort of thing. We, uh, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. There's a terrible tendency by a lot of people to assume that the spiritual world has no impingement upon the natural world. And our Western world has, has if not uh, in truth, have adopted that in practice but two-thirds of the rest of the world has never held that kind of a belief. They clearly, um, mostly out of animism, have uh, believed that there is definitely uh, uh, an impingement of the spiritual world upon the natural world. As Christians in the Western world, we'll tolerate uh, the fact that the Holy Spirit would somehow have an effect on me. But uh, we kind of cringe at the thought that an evil spirit could also have some influence on me. But biblically, that, that's just not a, even a question mark. Uh, we are clearly uh, warned that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. The only real option for us is, is to understand how and deal with that in a balanced way so we don't make that the whole issue when it's really not the whole issue. Our Liz, Alan, Loopy, you and me, slaves to demons and Satan, is there no stopping this rise of evil manifestation could we at any time fall prey to Satan and his demonic host? My spiritual awareness heightened all of a sudden. I mean, all this really trying hard in, you know, in meditation and all this other stuff and trying to achieve some, some state of, uh, of realization was nothing. I mean, all of a sudden I had a sensitivity to things that are unseen as if and it, you know really supernatural just means very natural it wasn't particularly spooky at all yeah. um, particularly when I knew that uh, I, I had the name of Jesus Christ to, to, to cover me otherwise that reality and I do believe it is a reality is quite overwhelming it would be like driving a Mercedes Benz to downtown LA having the keys in the ignition opening all the doors and walking away. I mean, you don't know who will come in and inhabit the car and drive it away. I believe that there are such things as demons, and basically what I mean by that is that there are spirits there that, that are not from God, that are, um, that are probably attached. Um, somehow they've rebelled against God and, go, and gone against Him, and um, they're trying to keep us from him. They're trying to keep us satisfied with the way the world is today or confused enough that we may want to participate in the evil that's going on out there. In the December 27, 1993 issue of Time magazine, the editors polled the American people asking if they believe in the existence of angels. 69% said yes, they believe in the existence of angels. What if those same editors asked the American public if they believe in the existence of demons? Would the answer be the same? Or would that percentage rise almost each year as evil seems to overtake our world day by day? I, I don't know that they know that they're getting brownie points from Satan, but I can tell you experience that I had. When I first became involved in this, I was almost asleep one night, and all of a sudden this huge figure and this sounds like I'm, you know, not all there, but this is what I experienced. This huge figure 
entered my room and it was from the ceiling to the floor and had a robe on it and it said do not become involved in this get out it was a threat to me what what's happened now in our culture and i think around the world for that matter uh, is a tremendous changing because when i went to a movie as a child it was godzilla king kong blob things you could see what is it now it's the exorcist it's poltergeist the things you can't see you got an entire culture including half of our christians frightened to death of things that go bump in the night and absolutely no fear of God. Just exactly opposite of Scripture. Because there's not a verse in the Bible where I'm to fear Satan. Who are we to fear? God. You see, that's the one fear that expels all other fears. Satan and his demons are real, according to those who study them. In many ways they are powerful. In many other ways they are powerless. Your power or powerlessness, they say, solely depends on your preparedness for any potential encounter you might have with the true forces of evil.